Uh, thanks everyone for coming. I'm Oad. I'll present Ahmed, which is a scalable and highly available transaction processing system uh, that we recently integrated in Apache Phoenix. It is a joint work with Eddie Bortnikov and James Taylor. So we'll start by talking about Phoenix. I'll let you know what it is. Uh, then we'll see why does Phoenix require transaction? Why do we care about it? We'll talk about transaction. What are they? We'll talk about Omid and how it works. Uh, then we'll talk about the integration, how we integrated Phoenix and Omid. Then eventually you'll see some experimental results to see uh, how good it is. Okay, so, so what Apache Phoenix? Basically, it's an OLTP, an operational analytics for a dupe. SQLs on top of HBase. It takes a SQL queries and transforms them to HBase query application calls. It uses standard SQL JDBC that increase developer productivity. It's very easy to use it. It's leveraging HBase horizontal scalability and it pushes as much work as is possible toward the server. It uses the HBase coprocessor, if you're aware of. It's a piece of logic that runs at the server size and therefore it's yet a very high performance. It parallels the queries, it works really good. Uh, the project started in 2014 by Salesforce and it's currently a top level Apache project. You can see that many uh, other companies using it. And in terms of develop productivity, okay, let's assume that I want to select from a table full all the entry was where bar is larger than 30, then I can write it like this in SQL. But if I want to do it directly in HBase call, then what I will need to do is to allocate an H table, get a scanner, give it a comparator, and so on. Then I want to iterate over the iterator, get the result. Eventually, I want to close the files. Okay, it's much easier to write it in SQL, and it's much error prone to write it in HBase. And of course, if you'll take a random user, most of the users will know SQL. At least more users will know SQL than know, know HBase APIs, right? This is how it works. So in general, the data access can be much faster than just using direct API, API calls. And this is because we're using coprocessor and we're also maintaining and using secondary indexes, okay, for easier access. We also parallelize the queries and, and using many other tricks. For example, uh, HBase metadata is very bloated. So what we are doing, we have a coprocessor that analyzes all the data at the server size, condense it, put it in an array, and then return it to the client. So a lot of this bloated information is not returned to the client. We save time. Some other stuff, when we, for example, you want to write a batch write to HBase, then HBase in its implementation open just one thread at the, at the server size to handle this batch. So we're doing many, many batches, write them concurrently, and we somehow enforce HBase to write more threads so it's much more efficient. Okay, so this is Phoenix. And Let's talk about what are transactions. So transaction, ACID transactions were defined by Jim Gray. And basically it's a multiple data access in a single logical operation, which is atomic, that everything occur or nothing occur. It's consistent, which means that it moves the database from a consistent state to another consistent state. It's isolated, which means that everything appears in isolation. When you're doing your writes, no one really sees it outside until you finish, and it's durable in a way that once you commit it, it cannot be disappeared, okay? It's there for good. And for our, for in our perspective as users, what is our transaction? It's a something like this. It has a begin, it ends with a commit, we write in between, and we know that until we successfully commit, no one will see what we write. Okay, we can be sure that if we fail, or we decide not to commit, no one will see this data, and we don't really care. Okay, so why do we care about it in Phoenix? So fix, first, support SQL transaction. If I want to support SQL transaction as Phoenix does, then as a user, you can just define a transactional table. In here, it's my table. And you select star from the table. This will start a transaction. Then you go, you can write your absurd. You can select, you can delete, do whatever you like. And only at the commit, 
it will be appear. Okay, it will be visible to others. If you won't commit, then it won't be. Okay, another thing, it's very important, is secondary indexes. If I have a secondary index, and I wanna, for example, I have a table and an index, and I wanna write to my table key K1 with value columns V1, V2, V3, and I wanna create an index that maps V1 to K1. Right? For easier access, if I want to access my data using the V1 column, then what I will do, I will go to the index and then read from the table. It would be much faster, but during my write, I want this to be atomic. I want to make sure that if I'm writing to the index, to the table, then the write to the index will be atomic. And I won't get into a situation that I wrote to the index, and then because of failure or something, it won't be added to the index, and then I'm kind of in a problem because I have the data in the table and not in the index, right? Or if it won't be atomic, then there might be a case that I have some race with other threads that want to read. For example, if I have the data in the table and not in the index, and someone will come and read from the table, and then the same one will come and read from the index and won't find it there, then this is not a valid run, right? And also, if I have stuff in the index and not in the table, someone will come to the table, to the index, and will read it and won't find it in the table, then it's also something that I want, don't want to see and don't want to do. Okay, so this is why we're using Omid. Omid is a transaction processing system for HBase. It was developed in uh, Yahoo Bar Barcelona in starting in 2011. Then in 2014, we integrated in uh, Yahoo's uh, search system. We use it for dynamic indexing to dynamic index the web. And in 2014, we scale it. We increase its throughput from 55k transactions per second to 380 transactions per second. And we added high availability for that, which is important in any production system. In 2016, we make it an Apache incubator. We donated to Apache. And in 2017, we started the integration with uh, Apache Phoenix. OK, these are the guys that contributed to the project along the way. And okay, so let's talk about Omid. Omid is very simple. It has a client library and a random servers. It's basically database agnostic in a way that you can just take and replace the database as long as it provides the same consistency guarantees that you need. And this way we can provide snapshot isolation consistency that we'll talk about it in a bit. And it's very scalable. Today our current implementation uh, a throughput of more than half a million transactions per second and with a very low latency, you'll see it at the end. And it's also highly available and highly available in a way that it does not incur any overhead in the main theme execution. In order to do Omid, it's also very simple. What you need to do is you just allocate a transaction manager. You can see the TM object at the top. Then we're allocating a T table, is some sort of an H table interface. And then you just do a begin in red. Okay, so I'm doing a begin, I'm getting an object. This, not really C. I'm getting a TX object. And then I'm just allocating a regular H base puts, as you can see in black. And I'm just adding it to the T table put with the transaction and the row again to row two as well, I'm adding that, and then I'm doing a commit. Once the commit succeeded, everything is there, everything is great. If it fails, then you don't really care. It fails, all the data will be disappeared. No one will see it, okay? This is how it's being used. Very, very simple. So let's get a little bit more technical and talk about transactions and snapshot isolation in order to explain how Omid works. Okay, so as we saw before, we said that transaction is an operation that starts by a begin and ends by a commit and has many reads and writes in between. Okay? And we said that the system at all maintains snapshot isolation where there are two points. A read point that occurred at the beginning of the transaction and all the reads during the transaction are actually reading from the point. This is a snapshot that is being taken at the beginning of the transaction. And a write point that occurs at the end of the transaction, at the commit where all the data that we wrote actually become visible, assuming that we successfully committed, right? And the only thing that we need to maintain in snapshot isolation is that we don't have write-write conflict, which means that if I have two transactions that write concurrently, and write to at least one common entry, then 
only one of them will be able to commit, the other ones will be aborted. Okay, that snapshots the solution. This is a very common uh, consistency guarantee and many transaction processing systems use it. And this is OMID. This is its architecture. Basically, you can see that it has a centralized transaction manager in black. This is actually, actually the, the brain of the system. It does everything. It lets transaction begin. It lets transaction commit. It does the conflict analysis that I talked about it. Okay, we need a right right conflict to maintain snapshot isolation. So it does the two as well. And what it also does, it persists the commit in a table that we call a commit table. We'll see later on how it works. And we have the client that asks the transaction manager to begin to commit, it gets the result. And you can see that the client also access the data tables without accessing the transaction manager. Which means it begins, it starts running, and then it can directly access the data table. And it also access the commit table that we'll see in a bit what is it. And of course we have a client. So this table, uh, these blue tables are actually HBase tables. Okay, while talking here, I won't talk about the regular OMID, but I'll talk about a recent low latency OMID that we developed. And it was written by Yoni Gottesman. You can see this photo in here. And basically, the difference between the architecture is that in here, the transaction manager persists the commit in the commit table. And in here, you can see that the client actually persists the commit. Instead of having one centralized transaction manager that does the commit, we distributed the commit along the clients. And what's happening now is that the client actually doing the commits. Okay? So let's see how it's working. So basically, I want to start. So the client want to start. It asks to begin a transaction, and it gets some ID, a transaction ID. Basically, transaction manager can have an internal counter and just increment the counter and return the next value. And know that this T1 is not only the transaction ID, it also be used by the transaction to identify the snapshot that it reads from. Okay, we'll see it in a bit. And what the client can do now, once it got this T1, it can go directly to the database and write. Okay, and because HBase is multi-versioning, we can utilize the fact that we can ask to write in a certain version. So what we're doing, we're going and we're writing key K1 with value V1 and version T1, and we write value key K2 at value V2 and version V2, uh, T2, and it's actually in the database. And even though it is in the database, no one really sees it. We need to maintain isolation, right? So no one really sees it, and we'll see in a bit when it becomes visible, and when I want to read, then I also I'll go to my database. I say, okay, I want to read K prime, and I'll take the last K prime with timestamp T prime, which is smaller than T1. Basically, T1 is a number, it presents a snapshot in the database, and I just want to take the last one before this, this, this number for each key. Okay, my snapshot can be looked like that, each key might have a different version, and I want to take the last one which is represented by my snapshot. So this is what I'll do. And once I wrote and I read, I can do a commit. So I'll go to the transaction manager and I'll say, okay, I want to commit. I'm transaction T1, and this is my write set. I wrote to key K1 and K2. What the transaction manager will do, it will do a contact analysis. And if it sees that there is a conflict, which means the transaction committed after T1 and wrote to either K1 or K2, it will return an abort result. Otherwise, it will allocate a commit timestamp, T2, and it will return it. Okay, and then the client will go and will persist the commit in the commit table. Okay, it will write that T1, transaction T1 was committed with commit timestamp T2. Right, and note that at the point where we, this information was written to the commit table, then magically all these entries become visible. This is the atomic point where the transaction actually occur. And the reason is that, that if now a new client st start and get a, an ID T3, it will go to the database, it will see this entry. If you want to read K21, it will go to this entry, it will see that K1, K1 with ver value V1 and version T1, and it can go to the commit table to check whether T1 was committed, and it see that it does with commit times T2. Now we check that T2 is smaller than T3 and read it. Okay, 
and that's basically all. This is how OMID works, and it's very simple, and it maintains snapshot isolation. And I guess that everyone, at least someone, some of you, thinks, okay, but that's cra quite crazy because every time that I'm, I'm going and read something, I need to go somewhere to some table that I don't know where it is, and to read this information. So what we're doing, we have a post-commit procedure that after the transaction, after the transaction committed, the client goes, we have some asynchronous thread that goes and adds to each entry, actually to each cell that we wrote. You can see in the red one, it actually adds a new cell. We call it the shadow cell, and it adds the commit timestamp to there. Once it added it to all the entries, it can remove the entry from the commit table. Now, and if a client, the same client, T3, want to read, it will go to the data table. We see this entry, and it will see this T2, and it, it can know that it read it, can read it without going to any tables. Okay, so there is a race in here. In some cases, if we didn't manage to update, so the client once in a while need to go to the commit table to check if it's there. And but in most of the cases, then it will find the information in the shadow cell, and it will perform really good. Okay, so in terms of durability, you can see that it's durable because once we committed to the commit table, the data is there, and we don't really care. Okay, so it's durable. It's the data of the commit will either be in the commit table or it will be in the shadow cells of the data. So it's durable. But what about high availability? Okay, how are we highly available? Okay, we say that the system is highly available, right? The general definition, where it doesn't have any single point of failure. When a, si a single point of failure is part of the system, that when it stops working, then the whole system stops working. And if we look at the system, then we can see that we have HBase tables, and HBase is highly available. Okay, if the client crashes before a commit, then we don't really care. It crashed, the data in there, no one will read it. So it's also okay if it crashes after a commit, then the data will be in the commit table. So also we don't really care if someone want to read, it will go to the commit table and read it. So the only problem is here is the transaction manager that once it crashes, the system stops working. So this is our single point of failure, right? I cannot begin a transaction, I cannot commit a transaction when I don't have a transaction manager. Okay, and so what we actually did is also very simple. We use a primary and a backup. We have two transaction managers. Both of them are running. One is the, the primary that's serving. The other one is a backup that sleeps. One in a while, once in a while it wakes up, sees whether, the, whether it can start running. Otherwise, it goes to sleep again. And we have some recovery state that does the leader election to say who is currently the leader. We also have some some state in Zookeeper that we need in order to maintain monoton uh, monotonicity of the counter. But in general, this is how it works. Okay, and the problem is that in here is that we might have a split brain. A split brain is a case where two transaction manager actually thinks that they are the leaders. Okay, there might be a case. We have a little bit, uh, a short amount of time that it can occur. And so the general case we'll, we'll do, we'll just add a lock Okay, and before we return a result, we need to go and acquire the lock and check that we are the leader. But of course, this lock is not some synchronized of Java on the machine. It's some lock that sits somewhere in Zookeeper, and we need to go and check it every time. And of course, we didn't do it. So what we did, we didn't use the lock. We use leases, which are time-based lock that we can imitate them locally, and it means that. Every 10 seconds or so, we need to go and renew a log some, somewhere and not every transaction, right? We get to half a million transactions per second, and only w once in 10 seconds, we need to go and renew the log. Another thing that we got into, and I won't get into, the tech into detail because it's way too technical, is that we let transactions to force aborts, to force other transactions to abort. We needed that to maintain snapshot isolation and also to guarantee high availability. If someone wants details, you're all very welcome to come after the talk and ask. Okay, last thing about OMID before I start talking about the integration is fast path transaction. What we actually did, we augmented OMID to handle single region transaction without going to the transaction manager at all. 
Okay, we have uh, some local timestamp that we allocate in each region, and we somehow synchronize this timestamp between the transaction manager and the region counter. We have them to be synchronized, because otherwise it won't be correct. So we did that as well. And we also augmented the conflict detection because we somehow need to do conflict analysis between regions and the transaction manager. To, so we augmented it as well. And overall, for singleton transactions, okay, for transactions that do one write or one read, we got a 2x improvement, latency reduction. Okay, That's it. Okay, so that's Amit. But what about the integration? So about the integration, we have two JIRAs, one for Amit support, you can see in here, and one for Phoenix support, it's an umbrella JIRAs. Each one of them has many, many JIRAs underneath. And the first thing that we started to do is that creating an abstraction layer. Tef uh, Phoenix uses Tefra before, used Tefra before. Tefra is also a transaction processing. And the thing that Tefra was all over, and we wanted to create a clean abstraction layer that will be able to connect Tefra as well and Amid and maybe future transaction manager. So we have to do that. Very technical, but that's work. And the second thing that we had to do is to add new scenarios for Amid. Amid is transaction processing. It doesn't work for SQL, and we somehow need to, to make it work for SQL. For the thing, I, the first thing for, for secondary index, for example, is atomic updates. How can we update the metadata? You saw we have a post commit procedure that go and add metadata. So in indexes and in Phoenix, many things happened at the coprocessor. We don't have the client at the coprocessor. Okay, so we somehow needed to add this information. Another thing is that only fly index creation. I have a table, full table, a huge table, and I want to create an index to the table. So I want to somehow find a spot in the table where I can be sure that I have a consistent state that I can start copy it to the index. Right, and what about the, index, the updates that occur afterwards? I need to take care of this as well. Okay, so this is also something that we had to do. We also had to extend snapshot isolation. We'll, do, we'll see that in a bit because the snapshot isolation and SQL consistency guarantees are not always matched, so we have to extend that as well. Okay, and about creating an index, let's assume that I have transactions that are running, T1, T2, they're running, they're committing, everything is good, and now I have a transaction T2 that started running, and while, while it's still running, I want to create an index, okay? So this is what I said before. So I'm creating an index. Which data will I put in this index? So I guess the T1 and T2 data is already in the database. It's committed. It's great. So I can put this in the index. But what about T3? Should I take its data? If it will commit, then I'll should. If it will abort, then I shouldn't, right? And the other thing, what about all the guys that started after the create index and after the create index completed. Okay, and note that what we're having here is I'm creating an index for a table. It can take hours, it can take even days if the table is large. I don't want to I don't want to pause the system or disable the transaction manager for all this time. Okay? So what we did is that we used copro two coprocessors and we're using Omid, we augmented the Omid with the fence. So basically what is being done once and create index initialized, we're going and we crea create a coprocessor that bulk insert all the information that's in the table of transaction that previously commit to the index. And then we call a fence of Omid. This fence guarantees that every transaction that started before the create index and committed afterwards will be aborted. Okay, so we don't have a data. We, we, we're not starting scanning the database. Whether it's data that we're not sure whether it will commit it or not. Every data that was not committed will be aborted. And know that it's for a very short amount of time. Only for transactions that started before the create index and, and committed afterwards will be aborted. It's just an atomic point in time. And now, for the rest of the thing, we had another coprocessor that goes and just add the data that increment incrementally to 
to the index. So we have two coprocessors, one that bulk insert all the data before the create index, and one that update, that add all the new updates during the index creation and afterwards. Okay? And only in this point, we make the index valid. Okay, so that's it. And another thing is that snapshot isolation. Let's assume snapshot isolation guarantees that I'm reading my own write. If transaction is running, it reads its own write. Okay, and now if you want to create a table, let's say I'm creating a table, and then I'm going and I edit these entries to the table. Okay, so I have now three rows in the table. And now what I want to do, I want to start a transaction and do this operation, insert into, into two, select ID plus 10 from 10, which means I want to go over all my entries and for each one of them add the new one while I'm adding 10 to my ID, right? So basically what I'm doing, I want to go over these ones and adding these ones, right? But if I'm reading my own writes, then while I'm going over these these ones, the these ones, and adding these and adding these one, then I'm seeing the new ones as well. So I'll add additional ones, right? I can get uh, either to an infinite loop or to get some state which is not valid. So I can say, okay, let's say that transaction does not read its own right; it reads only what's before. But then, if I have another operation that will see the ones that was written before and the ones that written after the transaction started then I want to add these six and not, uh, and, not uh, and not additional ones. Right, so what we did is also, it's very simple, we use checkpoint, it's like mini transactions inside transaction. Basically, every time that I want to do such an operation, I'm doing a checkpoint, and checkpoint guarantees that the transaction will not see data that was written before, after the checkpoint, okay, during the operation, okay? Basically, what we did is very simple because we, we want to keep it in the client side. We didn't want in any checkpoint go and call the transaction manager and ask it for checkpoint. Okay, we wanted to keep it as low latency as we could. So we bound the number of checkpoints that we allowed in each transaction to 50, which is reasonable. And we also have a read and write point. And what we are actually doing, instead of when we ask to begin a transaction, instead of getting one begin ID, we're getting a bunch of 50s, right? Just a, consecutive, just a consecutive chunk of 50 IDs. And we can use that. And basically, this is how it works. I have a read pointer and a write pointer. Both of them are pointing to T1. Now, I want to do this such an insert operation. So I do a checkpoint. You can see that the write pointer incremented to T2. And now when I'm doing this operation and actually reading from T1 and writing from T2, so it won't see the new ones. Once I finished, I'm returning my read point. If I want to do another checkpoint, then I'll do, I'll increase this one to T3, I'm right, and then I'll move the read pointer. Okay, so this is being used for, basically for these kind of abstract operations, and also we use it for rollbacks and index and other stuff. So this is highly used. Okay, some other stuff that we did is that we had to augment OMID scans. OMID scans is was built. OMID scans were built at the, basically at the client size. Okay, and what we're actually doing in here is that we had to move it to the server side. And the reason is that, that, as I said before, Phoenix remove a lot of metadata from the, a lot of information and return it to the client side with, without the information that we are actually needing. So we had to move all the logic to the server side to put it in a coprocessor and to filter that as well. Uh, that's another thing. Another thing that we have to do is that basically the population is in a bulk, and this bulk does not have the metadata of the commit, so we have to augment that as well. Also, for incremental updates, we had to somehow add the metadata as well. We had a lot of metadata work because there is a lot of data manipulation in there that is not using the client because it's happening in the copper system. So we had to make sure that all the information is getting to all the right places. It was a lot of work. And also, SQL things like Basically, transaction manager do a, a cell level config analysis and SQL 
conflict analysis is row level, so we had to do it as well. We had to do a conflict free rights because there are immutable tables and indexes, and also we we had to change the timestamps to be time-based and not just a counter because basically when you're looking at the log, you want to see a time. You want to see what's, if you have a problem, you want to see when it happened and you don't want to see just a number, okay? So we had to do all that and a lot of other stuff. Okay, and I just want to show some number numbers. So basically, here you can see a throughput latency graph, the X, the x-axis show you the throughput, the y-axis show you the latency. Of course, lower is better. And you can see that basically we have your single write transaction. And in red you can see Omid, the original Omid. It's not Omid 1, it's Omid 2. Okay, there are many versions, but it's not the low latency one. And you can see how the throughput increased, how the latency increased when I'm increasing the throughput. And the reason is that, that Omid was build in throughput, for throughput in mind. Okay, so what it does when the transaction manager actually does the commit, it batched, okay? Okay, it batched many commits and then do the co these commits. So this, of course, increased latency because transactions are waiting for others to commit as well. So this is wh how you can, s what you see in here. In the low latency, because we distributed the commit and the client do it, so basically what you're seeing, you can see how low is the latency. Right, this is in the blue line, and the, the orange one also show you the fast pass transaction, which are better because we're not accessing the transaction manager. Okay, we have here only single write transaction. We do it only at the region side, and this runs much like just H-based writes. Okay, we have a very small amount of overhead, but you get a consistency, okay, with this small amount of overhead. If I'm moving to five write transaction, then you can see that Amit is is much worse, but uh, but also you can see that Omid LL is worse and Omid is FPS, but still the performance is very very good, and Omid FP here is a little bit worse because it's five for each transaction and we we do not support it yet, so you can see that it added a little bit overhead because we're doing some conflict analysis at the server side, but still it's very good. If you move to ten right transactions, then you can see the, that it's still very good, and you and we're getting here to more than five five hundred, more than half a million transactions per second. Okay, and you can see how low is the latency. It's like twenty milli, four ten watts. Okay, in terms of breakdown, if I want just to take an operation and look at it and see, and see where my time, where did I spend my time? So you can see that the Omid, for for example, for ten high transaction. Okay, I have your Omid, Omid low latency, just H-based writes, and the fast path, and I have the latency. So you can see that for 10 side transaction, Omid takes a lot of time. Okay, the, the, the reason is that you can see that the, you can see the begin in blue and the commit in green, and the red one is the H-based writes, the latency of H-based writes. And you can see that in Omid, for example, the begin and the commit took the same amount of time, and the reason is that that every begin needs to wait to all the previous commits to be persisted in the database, otherwise it won't be correct. This is something that we change and fix in Omid LL. And you can see that in Omid LL, okay, how the start, how the begin is small, and how the commit is relatively small. If I'm comparing just age base right, that you can see in here, versus the a transaction right, then I have a 16 versus 21 or 22 millisecond, okay? And for 10 right transactions, so I get a lot of consistency by giving just, thank you, by giving just five additional uh, milliseconds. Okay, and here you can see that in, s in five size transaction, this is basically the same case. Okay, so that's basically it. Okay, so we added a small amount of latency to get consistency, and we connected uh, OMI to, to Phoenix. So Phoenix, we saw it's a relational database, HBase layer on top of HBase, actually a SQL layer on top of HBase. Uh, it needed a scalable and highly available transaction processing system, and durable, of course. And we had the OMI, which is used in production in Yao. It's tested, it's highly available, it provides low latency. And so we did an integration to provide an efficient OLTP for a dupe that supports transactions. Okay, thanks everyone.